All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today is February 26th and Tuesday. So we're going to cover, continue last uh, lecture, which was process synchronization. And uh, again, like last session, today is also important. Today's session uh, will basically continue with the deadlock topic in the next two sessions. So you have to have an understanding about like uh, synchronization primitives, semaphore, deadlock, critical section, and make sure you understand all of this. That's why uh, homework two has a like a deadline, you know, uh, that is in what is it, uh, March twelfth, and. So, <clears throat> after these lectures are done, make sure you understand all of them. All right? So, uh, this is a summary of uh, what we did in the process of synchronization, race condition, and critical section problem. And we uh, covered a few solutions to this problem with their shortcomings and uh, how we basically figure out what is a good way to implement them. Right? So then you should have like already formed your groups on Autolab and Autograder. There was an issue for a couple of groups. Uh, I noticed more groups now have joined, which is good, but make sure you do it soon. And make sure your group name exactly matches the one on GitHub Classroom. So just, you know, copy and paste. Make sure there's no typo or anything. It makes it easier uh, for us to basically, you know, move the scores. And submit your initial empty design document. Although there have been groups that are on the, on the Autolab, so make sure your groupmates also join your invitation. So when you create a group and then you invite your groupmates, they have to log in and confirm that. Uh, besides that, when you you know finally form your group, otherwise basically they don't they they don't get the grades. Um, once you join, then you just initial whatever you have, which is empty. It's fine. Uh, just to make sure that you do it, so you we all we all know that the submission process has no issue. You you are submitting the way that you should do if server has an issue, we have time to fix it. I mean, I already tested with one submission, but, you know, maybe, uh, it, I don't know, there's a corner case or something that is common, so we can fix that, all right? So do that. Again, you will get, you'll get un unlimited uh, uh, submissions, so then you'll actually submit yours till Friday night, all right? So today we're going to talk about semaphores a little bit more. So we got introduced to them a little bit last session. Today we're going to talk about them and their, how they are implemented. And uh, three or basically four problems of synchronization. Uh, one is bounded buffer, readers and writers, and dining philosophers. Then we're going to talk about monitors and condition uh, uh, variables. And uh, then as an exercise, we're going to cover the sleeping barber problem. All right. Any question before we start this? All right. So, uh, last session we basically had the five solutions to the cr critical section problem, and uh, so we, we, we and, and each of them with their shortcomings. So, disabling interrupts is not good because it can crash the system. It does not like let other processes progress, even if they're not like attempting to enter their critical section. The simple lock variable, if it's not protected, if it's not atomic, then the problem is it doesn't actually solve the problem. It reduces it to a, like a shorter critical section, but it still can happen and uh, it suffers from the race condition when you want to access that lock and modify that. It, a lock variable, which is atomic, uh, like either with the test and set lock or with the uh, compare and swap instruction, they actually work. Uh, the, 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 there was the uh, fourth implementation with the toggle, which was not good because it did actually, it prevented from, it basically satisfied the mutual ex exclusion, but it did not satisfy the progress necessarily. And then um, the last one was when the TSL is not supported in the hardware, with the extra overhead in the software, we could finally overcome the issues and uh, basically uh, satisfy all the uh, requirements for the critical section problem, all right? And so, we basically also saw that the, the, uh, a problem with some of those was the busy waiting. So, a lot of those were just like busy waiting and checking, which is not good because it wastes CPU time. And so, what we asked is that how we can basically block them and... Uh, then uh, this, today, semaphore is basically a primitive that's 
going to do this and handle this, and then it's a lower level primitive, and then it can be basically used in higher level program. And the higher, I mean, even still it's in low level programming. But So, uh, Semaphore is a <coughs> synchronization tool for critical section problem, and it's the basic concept is just like it's an integer, and then uh, it's, uh, you, can do, uh, you can call two operations on it, either <coughs> excuse me, wait or signal. The, you might also come across the other terms, which is like uh, P and V. They were like older terms. They were just like short for, you know, some uh, Dutch words. So you don't have to know them, but it's just like if you see them, it's V and P. I don't know. This actually looks like a, you know, arrow down, but it's actually semi up. So I don't know. It's like U. I don't know how you can memorize it, but... Um, so the weight is like semi down, uh, in your Pinto's code you will see that, and signal is like semi up, right? You're increasing and decreasing. So an implementation using busy weighting, simple, is like, you know, on a weight or semi down, you basically wait or loop until uh, the, uh, the, the integer becomes positive, and when it comes positive, then you decrement it. The implementation of signal or semi up is up, just increment it. And well, this one is, sim is simple because it's uh, basically running uh, atomically. It's just like one instruction, assuming that it is like running, you know, uh, again, in not multiple steps. However, this one, we are again assuming that they are, there are no interruptions. Otherwise, there's still an issue because multiple wait calls might run on different threads and both of them might pass the while condition and then both enter this line and then decrement it. But we are, we are not talking about this today. Uh, we kind of like covered that. Today we're going to cover a lot of more concepts and uh, so we are assuming that there is no interruption in this. For example, in, in, because they're very short primitives, Sometimes it's allowed to actually disable interrupts here and then enable them here so that they can basically run one after another. Well, not in this case because this while is an infinite loop. So again, you, the implementation would be different. So you have to like uh, disable interrupts, check if it's zero. Uh, if not, you re-enable the interrupt and then wait somehow. We, we, we're actually going to see a, a better implementation next. Okay? So... Uh, Without busy waiting, if you want to like implement this, this is a bit different. So, basically, the value is decremented, and then if it has been, you know, put to negative number, then the thread will now block. The reason is, the order of these actually, again, it's not very important. Each of it, if you change the order, you solve something, you create another issue. But again, the idea is, you when you down on a semi, if the semi is not available, if the integer is not positive, and basically by, you know, decrementing it, you go into the negative, then the resource is not ready. The resource is not available. So this thread that wanted to semi down on that resource should just, like, wait and block. And that's what this block does. It does not, like, busy wait, but it actually blocks the thread from getting scheduled. Once it is scheduled back to this line, that means the semi has been opt by another thread or, you know, the resource now is available so this thread can continue. All right? The signal or semi op primitive uh, or operation is basically just incrementing it. And again, if the value is zero or negative, meaning if before this incrementing, the semi value was negative, that means a thread had it downed on it and then is now blocked, right? If another thread had down on it and it's now negative and we increment it and it's still negative or zero, that means someone is waiting for a resource and now we are upping. So we are providing that resource. So then we break that up from, you know, the queue. We, we, we obtain that one of the processes. They may be one or more. We obtain one of them and then wake them up, all right? So we must make sure that no two processes can execute wait and signal operations at the same time. Again, here is not the interrupt on, off, whatever, but these, these have been designed so that they run atomically, so, you know, they should not be interrupted, okay? 
So, if you have forgotten or didn't grasp the idea of the semaphore, um, it's just that uh, it's for when you have like a limited number of resources, the number can change. And then there are multiple threads or processes basically that can access them, right? So, for example, uh, it can be just one. Actually, we're going to cover that in the next lecture. But the idea for the multiple one, the, re the reason that you're like incrementing or, you know, decrementing is that uh, let's say we, we all want to share papers, right? I have these every session. So, we, we want to share uh, papers, right? So, to use them. So, if there's no paper here, I have to wait. If there's also you know, another thread, there might be many threads that want to like use papers. Now, semi up means like incrementing the integer, the number of papers here. I add one, and now we have a paper here, and then maybe that there's no one downing. I add another one by semi up, and now the value has incre incremented to two. Now, if another thread wants to semi down, they want to access the resource, they do semi down, they call it. Now, if the value is available, the resource is available, basically, they are allowed to use the resource, right? And then continue. And if another thread now wants to, again, sum it down, they again come here, the value is still positive, they obtain it, the remaining is not negative, is basically, you know, zero, so they, again, they continue. Now, if another thread comes and sum it down, meaning they want a resource, but well, there's no resource, because there are, like, you know, two pro uh, threads already using those resources. Now, uh, if, if this one wants to sum it down, again, it has to wait. So the imp implementation here is that they basically put it to negative and then block. Now, since the value is negative, someone is waiting. When another one, one of these that were using this resource is done, they want to sum up. They want to return, basically, the resource. They increment it, and because it is zero, it was negative one, they basically wake this other process up and then tell, hey, yeah, go ahead, take it, right? So that's the idea of semaphore, and it can be, you know, you can think of it if, you know, we have a okay, blackboard with multiple sections, if you have, like, multiple chalks, that's how, you know, you, you delegate. Now, it can also be, uh, uh, it, 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 in, the, in your, yes? Ne not necessarily. Not necessarily. We're going to talk about it. Usually, you, you, you can actually set a cap to it, yes. Uh, but the concept is either one or many. The one is a different, is a specific case, specific case because you're basically ensuring only one thread is running. If there are more than one threads, then you can set the cap, yes. But yeah, we're gonna look at it. Yeah, it's either it's boolean or binary. So, the implementation that you might see in, the, in your Pentos code is a little bit more like this, because it's not an actual, just an integer, but it's an actual struct. And uh, the reason is because if there are all multiple threads that are waiting on it, you, when you want to like wake them up, there should be a list. And each list is associated with one semaphore. It's different. <coughs> Right? Because there might be multiple resources. There might, each thread might want to access multiple semaphores. Right? So you cannot have like one list of, you know, access to resource. No. If I only want the papers, I only need to be on this queue. I don't want to wait for the chalks. Right? If there are other threads are there. So it just like makes more sense to have one list for every semaphore and put all the threads uh, that want to wait for that semaphore on that list. And again, if you want to wake up a process, you just look at that list, right? And uh, so, it's like, it's kind of like a struct, and then you basically access it through, uh, you know, the pointer, and then basically the same thing, but it's just like, you know, more like this. All right? Yes? Well, again, the implementation is different. So I think in the Pintos code, actually, it does not do that. It actually waits till it's uh, zero, and then uh, it's, it's, I think at first it waits for it to be positive, and then decrement it, right? These two should match. If you decrement it first, what happens? If it's zero, that means that the resource is not there. So if you decrement it, it goes to negative, and if it's negative, then you block. Now, in here, first you increment, 
And if it's less than or zero, meaning before the incremention, it was negative. Not even zero, negative. So that means someone had semi down and then there was no resource, so they're blocked, so now they should be woken up. It can be negative five. There might be six threads waiting. So you wake one of them. Right? If the, if the resource is zero and then six threads comes and semi down, right? They call semi down. The value of this will go to negative six and all of them will be blocked, right? All right. So the process speed actually waking up on that is zero now because there are, say, four more threads waiting. No, they, they won't be the thread. They access the resource. They take turns. Again, listen to the example and then you see. If the resource is zero, six different threads call semi down. What happens? Each of them will decrement the value. So now the value will be negative six. And then because it's negative, because no resource is available, all of them will block. Now, you tell me, if one thread who had the resource calls semi up, what should happen? What, what is the expected behavior? One of the threads should basically be woken up because one resource is now available, right? So basically, we value it up because now it's negative five. It's still negative. So we wake one process up. Okay? All right. So using semaphores as synchronization tool. So we have counting semaphores, which are an integer value, right? It can range. You can basically put a cap on it or not. It, again, that's... Something, it, it's, but it does not matter. The, the behavior doesn't change. Either three or four, it doesn't matter. Now, if there are binary semaphores, it's different because basically they're known as muted flocks and basically it's different because you're ensuring only one thread is accessing, not multi, but one. And again, the reason is that the type of the resources that you use, semaphores or locks, are a bit different. If you allow multiple semaphore, I mean m uh, many threads use something, they are not modifying a shared variable, right? Because multiple threads cannot, sh you know, share uh, modify a shared variable. So in the places that you use semaphore, it's like has a, just like you know a different criteria that when you use that. So, but locks is usually used, for example, when you want to modify a shared variable, so you only want at most one thread. Right, And if there is, again, in those situations that you want to use semaphore, the limit actually, you know, is limited by whatever you define. If it's a queue, then the size of the queue. If it's actual, I don't know, hardware resource, that's that. So the mutual exclusion is provided by this. So you basically initialize this semaphore to the number, whatever. It can be, you know, n, for example. And then you call wait on it. If it is available, then you've been given the access, and then you enter the critical section, and then you signal at the end so that you basically, you know, it's like putting it back. All right? Now, if it's n is 1, again, we're talking about lock. So you might also see the other syntax, which is lock s. It's already initialized to 1. And then when you acquire it, you basically, again, it's, it's kind of like semi down, but because it's a you know, specific case, it's also with a different syntax. Acquiring the lock, going through the critical section, and releasing the lock. Okay? Any question? No? All right. So, now I'm going to go over a couple of uh, examples in the, uh, in the synchronization problem. So, one of the first problem is bounded buffer problem. So, the bounded buffer problem is when we have a shared buffer with n slots and we want to basically store n items. They can be anything, integers. Producer processes uh, data items and puts them into the buffer and then there's another consumer that gets the data from the buffer and, you know, consumes them whatever that it wants to process, okay? So, the buffer so far is shared. But also, we had similar example uh, last session. If the buffer is shared and it has like n slots, then maybe the producer is producing at a higher rate than consumption, right? Then the buffer would be, you know, overflowed. You might like overwrite data. Or if the consumption rate is higher than the production, then... The, the consumer starts reading old data. 
So you also have to be able to signal the number of items that are there. So in this case, for example, we have an empty that keeps the number of empty slots in the buffer and variable full who, where, where, you know, keeps the uh, full items, all right? So we, the producer process, let's say, we, are, we were basically providing a few solutions. Some of them have like shortcomings. So let's take a look at each of them. So if you want to implement them only with one semaphore, right? Semaphore is for critical session. If you're dealing with one critical session, can we solve it with one semaphore? So let's say we have like integers empty and uh, n and full zero. That's the initialization. So the producer basically produces an item. And then when it wants to actually put it in the buffer, it first waits for the empty. If there, there are no empty slots, it should wait. It should basically wait until there is a free slot so it can, like, you know, put the new item there. Once it's out of this loop, once there is a, a empty slot there, it waits on the mutex, which is the semaphore that we have de uh, defined, and then add the item to the buffer, and then changes the empty and full va uh, va uh, values, decrement empty and then full incremented, and then signal the mutex or release the lock. So basically, accessing the buffer empty and full variables have been guarded by the mutex. Does it seem right? That's basically the critical section, right? Accessing the shared variables, they're guarded by the mutex. So, how about the consumer? So, the consumer basically waits for the mutex, and then if we have like a, you know, item in the full, then we remove that from the buffer, we decrement the full, we increment the empty, and then we signal the mutex, we release the lock, and then consume the item that, that has been retrieved. Again, the critical section of the accessing the buffer, full and empty items, have been guarded by the lock. Is there any problem with the solution? Yes. In this case, again, be yes, because the, the shared variables are going to be modified, we're going to use the mutex or lock, which is a binary semaphore, so only one of them can enter. Any problem with this? What's that? Mask? Yeah, the mask was an implementation when the, there was no TSL available, right? Petersons or Petersons, right? So we're not dealing with the, the type of the implementation anymore. We are assuming that, you know, we can use the mutex, uh, you know, as a primitive now. So the Petersons uh, implementation basically was the implementation of the <coughs> weight and signal. But now we're using them as a function, and we are assuming that they run atomically. They're not like interrupted. They actually work. So once you call the wait function, either you acquire the lock or you block, and you know so on. So the problem with this is we have guarded the critical section, but our functionality is not like correct because let's take a look at this consumer. Once we enter here, what happens if there is no full? What if the buffer is just like not ready yet for us? We leave it and, you know, signal the mutex. But then we start consuming something which is not there. Basically, we didn't update the, you know, item here because that was in the if. So if you want to wait for something like that, then you are keeping the lock. That's not good. So this implementation is not good. You got the problem? The code from here to here runs with the you know, critical section guarded by the mutex, but it does not guarantee that you get an item because maybe that item is not ready. And when you actually run this, this process is not w busy waiting till, uh, till an item is ready. And you cannot put this into this. You may say, okay, we'll take this into this if. No, you can't because this process may take an hour. You don't want to hold an hour, this lock for an hour. So this is not good. So the second implementation, again, is with, not, with one semaphore. This time is a little bit different. So the producer is actually the same. So the consumer this time does this. So if we don't have anything in the, you know, uh, in the, in the full, we loop. 
so that we know, okay, you know, we're, we're not going to go into mutex before. Once we, we pass this while, wait for the mutex, remove the item, like the same code, signal, and then consume the item. So basically, we, basically first we check the full here and then do it. Is it good? Does it solve the problem? Well, I, I give you a hint. It solves the problem that once we reach there, we have a, you know, we probably have an item. But, what's the problem with this one? Busy waiting, Busy waiting is a problem, but uh, we, we don't care about that now. That's a different problem. We're, uh, we, our synchronization problem is here something more than that, more important. Any guess? So, we are accessing full without the mutex. The full is a shared variable, right? We are accessing it outside of the critical section. We have, this, we have guarded only from here to here for critical section. But now we are accessing full here. What can go wrong? Well, you tell me. If, if we pass this while and the full value now changes, it's not valid anymore. And we have not guarded it because the mutex is only obtained here. So, this again implementation is wrong. In this example, as we saw, for example, the, produ the producer basically only increments the full. But what if we have two consumers? So, one of them decrements the full right after here. Okay? So, no good. Next one. How, how about like we increment our sum of force to two? All right? Uh, let's see. We have like empty is n and full uh, zero. Let's have a semaphore for each of those. And uh, while true, the producer only produces an item, waits for an empty slot, and then add the item to the buffer, and then signals the full. So we are considering empty and full, each of them as a semaphore. So the integer value within them basically uh, represents, you know, the semaphore. Any problem with this? The consumer also will basically do this. So it waits for a full, if it has been signaled, if there is an item in the full, then it uh, removes it from the buffer, signals the empty now, and then consumes the item. What's the problem with this one? Come on, come on. It's going to be the same thing. Just repeat it. Same problem. Shared variable, not guarded. Buffer. Buffer is not guarded here. So, you are waiting, but if we have both full and empty are not zero, then none of these are sleeping. So, both of them can enter in this area and then modify the buffer at the same time. Not good. All right? So, again, mutual exclusion to this area or accessing to, uh, the shared variable is not Satisfy. So, solution four is uses three semaphores. Let's see if we can solve it by adding another one. So, this time, we actually have one semaphore for each of them. So, we have a mutex to access the buffer, because the buffer is something that is, can be modified by both of them. So, we only have one lock, again, binary semaphore, and a semaphore for full, as we just saw, and a semaphore for empty. Right? Because one of them is incrementing, one of them is decrementing, uh, the one decrementing should wait for the other one to be ready. Right? So, now this solution, in the process, in the uh, semaphore, uh, with the three semaphore solution, basically the producer produces an item, waits till it's, uh, there is an empty slot. Once there is an empty slot, it does it, uh, adds the buffer, but with the mutex acquired. So, so to ensure there is no one else accessing it. And then the consumer process now, basically waits for a full, or waiting for an item to be there, or from a signal by the producer. Once it is there, again, it acquires the mutex, removes the item from the buffer, and then releases them and signals the empty, because now that slot is empty. All right? Any question about this problem? No? All right. So, this basically summarizes the implementation that we covered. So, the next problem that we're going to cover is the readers and writers problem, all right? So, in this problem, we have multiple readers and mu multiple writers to a database. And remember, if there are multiple threads accessing a shared, da shared variable, just accessing meaning reading, there's no problem because the data is not changing. They can, like, all, you know, read it. The problem only 
starts when w- at least one thread wants to write something. Now, if there are multiple writers, the, the issue is still there. If there is one writer and one or many readers, again, there is still issue, right? So, when there is a writer, we want no more processes accessing the data. And there are variations of this problem, if you read the book, for example. But, uh, again, the concept is the same thing. The order doesn't matter, the priority doesn't matter here. So, let's see, the writer process is like this. So, it waits on a mutex. When the mutex is obtained, then it writes to the database and then signals the mutex. Again, it's like acquiring and releasing. You might see that terms as well. Right? That's simple. Again, just like as we have uh, seen, when you want to modify it, you obtain it. So no one else does it. The readers, though, is a little bit different. Because if you think about it, how you can ensure the readers to have uh, access to the data if there is no writer? If you obtain the same lock for each reader, then you are ensuring no more than one reader access it. That just like slows your system down because maybe your writer like wants to access every day, once in a day, and then your readers are accessing, you know, much more frequently. So you're now slowing it down. So how to ensure? And if you don't use the, this mutex at all, then how can you ensure that, you know, if there is a writer, then no reader accesses it? Or vice versa. You ensure that if there is at least one reader, then this mutex should be locked so that this writer doesn't enter its critical section. But you have to ensure it doesn't matter if it's like one reader or hundred reader. You have only one lock. So, for such problems, yes? Hmm? Make it unlocked? Making another lock. Okay. So far, you, you saw the trend of adding more semaphores or locks. Yes, we're going to use more than one. And, but you have to have a basic, uh, I mean, we can't wait as an exercise here, but such problems you have to rethink and, you know, try not to read the solutions because once you read the solutions, it's more or less clear when you read it a couple of times. But these can, like, change slightly the problem and then it's, you know, you, you should basically ex- exercise on these so that you learn how to solve these, right? There are tons of exercises, uh, similar, you know, problems. They can be in your home, uh, quiz or homework or, you know, exams. So, and then make sure you think and uh, verify every situation and order of execution. So, the reader process in this example is going to, like, do this. So, if you have a mutex, which is the second log, and we also have the right mutex, which is the same thing. So, let's take a look at here. So, because we care about the number of readers, because we actually, if we have a reader then there is a situation. If we have one or more readers, it's a different situation. We need to basically count the number of readers. That's, you know, the baseline. So, because the reader count is going to be modified by each reader, so there should be a mutex to access that shared variable. Right? You can approach it, you know, this way. So, read, reader count is something that each reader increases. And then they obtain the lock before doing that. Now, if there are the first reader, then they obtain the lock for the writer. If they're not, that means the first reader has already obtained a lock and we don't care anymore, right? We're just leeching. So, if the first reader comes here, they obtain the reader's lock. They also obtain the writer lock, so the writer doesn't go and, you know, write something there. And then they're now they're reading. At this point, if the second reader comes, uh, they only need to basically uh, access the reader mutex, modify the number of readers, and then just read. Okay? That's only uh, because this has uh, been, you know, in my position right now. This is clear. Now, they can read the database after releasing the reader count, right? So, remember, again, the first reader has still the lock for the writing, but the reader count is now free. Any reader can acquire it, modify it, again, put it down there, and just read from the database, you know, we share. Now, the problem comes when I want to, I am the holder of this, right? Now, if I want to uh, finish, what should I do? Should I just release this lock? Yes or no? 
Why? Pass it to the next reader if there is one. If there is another reader, I have to pass it to them. Why? Because if I just release this, what happens? The writer was waiting for it. What happens if the writer just like grabs it and starts modifying? There are other readers that are accessing. We don't want this. Right? So, this is the difference between here. So, when a reader is done with their reading, they want to modify the reader count again, after which, if they are the last person, then they signal the lock. So, in this case, uh, the example that I made does not exactly make sense because you don't actually see me passing this. But the operations are, you remember, upping and downing. It does not matter if you down on a semi, you are expected to, you know, also up the semi yourself. The programmer is writing the whole threads. There are multiple of them, right? So if the semi has been downed, or the lock has been acquired, let's say, by readers, we, we share it among ourselves here. I don't actually hold it as a thread, but it is there. We have acquired it. So the writer cannot, like, obtain it. It has not been released by anyone. It does not matter who releases it. No one has done. Only the last reader does it, right? So the last reader, once they're done with them and decrementing, if there are no readers anymore, they say, okay, now we as readers will return this to the writer so they can go ahead. Alright? Is the example clear? If you have a question, go ahead and ask. Nope. Good. So, this does not have many solutions and issues. Basically, this is the way to do. And you, again, this should, gives you, uh, this should give you ideas about like, how to solve these questions. Any mod- anything that you want to access with mul- multiple threads that can modify, you have to guard it. Right? Here, we're modifying this. This has a guard. Here, we're modifying this. This has a guard. And uh, you know, we're also ensuring the functionality of reader writers with you know, this and this. Okay? So, next will be the dining philosopher's problem. This uh, is going to be a little bit not intuitive. It's a little bit different than the other ones. Okay? So, let's see. So, the dining philosopher's problem is when we have like five philosophers sitting at, at, at a round table and they want to eat spaghetti and uh, so there are five chopsticks. That's it. You don't have forks or anything. There's just like five, five chopsticks and they're placed like this. So there are five plates each in front of one of them and there are chopsticks between them like that. Five of them. So now the question is or the requirements uh, is that Eating the spaghetti requires the use of two chopsticks. You can't just like, use one, right? And, but you have to pick, uh, pick, up, uh, pick them up one at a time. You have to pick one chopstick, then the other one. Instructions are happening one at a time, right? And philosophers don't talk to each other, right? They don't have any means of communication. They only think and eat, right? That's how the philosophers live. So... And so we have a semaphore of chopstick, which is like, you know, five of them, and each of them is, is initialized to one. So if you basically acquire a chopstick, you're calling sema down on it, and then you obtain, and if the chopstick is not there, you, you should wait for someone to sema up that specific chopstick so it will become ready. All right, so is the problem at least clear? All right, so let's see what's the problem. So... For philosopher I, there are five of them, and remember, they're in a round table. So, we call this. So, we wait for the chopstick I, and we wait for the next chopstick, and we have to do this to basically start back from zero. And then, once we acquire the chops, two of the chopsticks, then we eat for some time, and then we basically release those chopsticks, and then go back to thinking. And again, we loop. We wait for the chopsticks, we eat, Release them and think. What's the problem with this? What is it that lot? So let's say if all the philosophers are right-handed, right? So they all start together. All the uh, chopstick eyes are available. So all of them obtain their right-handed chopstick, 
and then now they want to like get the left one and it's gone. Right? So, it basically, mutual exclusion is ensured. No one can enter this, uh, or, uh, be, no one can uh, access the two chopsticks at the same time. They cannot like, you know, fight for a chopstick. They're not going to like, you know, do that. But, it, it, resu- it may result, not necessarily, but it may result in a deadlock. Okay? So, a deadlock is when two or more processes are basically waiting for each other. Right? So, this one tells the other one, you give me the chopstick and I'll finish first. And then the other one is like, you give me the chopstick and I'll finish first. Right? Uh, so, the simple form is this. Let's uh, have S and Q as semaphores and it shows us to 1. If these processes run at the same time, chances are this acquires S, this acquires Q. This is now waiting for S, this is now waiting for Qs. So, they b- both wait forever. Okay? There's no resolving the issue here. So, this is one of the problems that is happening in this, in, with this implementation. And so far with the, you know, with the things that we have learned, it's difficult or impossible. There are ways to figure this out. So, one thing is to allow a philosopher to pick up his chopstick only if both chopsticks are available. So, the deadlock happens if they acquire one and then they wait for the other. So, what if we uh, have a critical section which they don't run at the same time, and if they run, if the two shops are, are, are available, then they obtain both of them, so the deadlock doesn't happen. So they can actually eat and then release them, because, again, we are assuming a non-zero speed of progress. So once they start eating, they will finish eating at some point, depending on how, you know, hungry they are, and then put him back. So the other solution is to use an asymmetric solution. Make some of them like, you know, right-handed, some of them left-handed. So, in that case, if, uh, if I am reaching for my right-hand ch- chopstick, the other philosopher is reaching their left-handed. So, this way, th- the situation does not happen. It's not, ma- it's not as simple or as, you know, as intuitive, but using this uh, situation, you can prevent that deadlock from happening. And this can be a good exercise that you can think of these. Again, you know, have them, you know, numbered, actually write a piece of code, try to, you know, run it at different orders, come up with different examples and see if it, you know, resolves the situation. Should you just, like, define one of them, you know, left-handed, or odds and evens, how does that work? All right? So, there are, there are overall, there are issues with, you know, ri- using semaphores. So, we just saw, if the process is uh, 0 and 1 are running, and then they obtain, like, you know, semaphores with a different order, what can happen? A deadlock, right? It's not guaranteed, but it may happen. And once it happens, there's no way out. So, what about this one? If you signal mutex first and then wait for it, what happens in this situation? We usually wait and then signal. What happens if we call it in reverse order? Hmm? Let's think of an example. The semaphore is here. We usually have like waited, and then once you uh, once we obtain it, then we access our critical section and then you know release it, and then we're we're done. What happens if we first call release when we enter? I put like, I don't have two of any of them, but, right? And then enter down my critical section, and once I'm done, I call down. What happens? Yeah, basically we're not ensuring mutual exclusion, because we're increasing it first, and then decrementing it. So multiple threads can basically increment it at the same time and then, you know, access it without actually uh, the mutual exclusion. Yes? What's that? It basically does not function. Yeah, that's what I mean. It basically does not function. So the order that you call these actually matters, right? It's not just like any of them. That's the issue. And what happens if you call mutex and then you call on mutex itself again? Let's say it can be either mutex or even a semaphore. But if you have like called on it, if you call on it again while holding it, what happens? You block yourself. Yeah. If if you have obtained this, 
and you want to obtain it again, it's not there anymore. And you're not going to, you know, probably w- w- wake up if specifically there's no other one, you know, putting this one back, right? So, again, you, you, you might end up in a deadlock with yourself. And omitting of wait or signal or both, what happens if you call wait but not signal? Or if you call signal but not wait? What happens? What's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you only release it, you're actually incrementing the whole binary one. Or if you just acquire them, forget to release it, then you're starving others, right? So, the problem, these problems occur not because of the design of the semaphore, but the, the wrong use of uh, these operations. And the problem is now, th- these can happen. Because who, who are using these? There, there are programmers. And programmers are humans. And we have all made terrible mistakes in coding already, right? And some of them, that, like these, can end up you know, in a bad situation. It's not like an error or something. It's a, you know, a deadlock, right? So the pro- these problems basically are with the semaphores. And so to do this, uh, there are other primitives, usually higher level primitives, that allow programmers to use them without the hassle of you know, implementing you know, semaphore and forgetting like, these things. And so these operations are usually in the low level coding, such as systems coding. And uh, otherwise, the operating system themselves can provide the higher level programmers or users with other primitives. Right? They can use those. Uh, operating system can intervene if you, I don't know, have a lock and there's a, maybe a timeout on it. The operating system can exit and then release that instead of you. So these are just like examples that you can think of. And uh, so let's ta- take a look at the monitors. All right. Any question before this? All right. So a monitor is a higher level. Uh, abstraction. So it's not an actual code, but it's an abstraction. The monitor basically provides synchronization to whoever wants to use it. So only one process may be active within the monitor, right? So how does that? So a monitor usually is like it, it has some shared variables, it has some operations, and then there are some initializations, right? And then, basically, now this wants to ensure that whoever wants to call any of these procedures or access these variables, they only will access it one at a time. Now, it, it like basically encapsulates all the synchronizations, so, you know, as a user, you don't have to worry about them anymore. You don't have to obtain any lock anymore. They are all implemented here, right? So, they take a lock before doing anything and then releasing it after that, Right? And, or, unless, you know, you, the procedure is finishes or they're waiting for a condition to happen. So they want to block. In these situations, they have to release a lock. But again, these are implemented within them. So let's take a look at this. So we have an example here. Performing transactions on bank account. Right? So there are, there's a race condition. If you want to deposit and also withdraw, there is a race condition on your balance. Right? Or if you want to uh, deposit two different values at the same time, maybe they overwrite each other and instead of like adding them to your balance, one of them only applies in the end and you basically lose money. Right? So for these obvious reasons, you want critical section and you want synchronization. But let's take a look at this. So if you have a monitor account, which has a, like a balance, and your initialization is just like the balance is zero, let's say, and you're, you have two operation on it. Either you want to withdraw or you want to deposit. When you want to withdraw an amount, there are like, you know, situations. If the amount is negative, that's an error. If the amount is more than your balance, you can't do that. If the uh, the amount is, you know, equal or more than or less than balance, then you basically reduce the balance. And when you deposit an amount, again, if the amount is negative, that's an error. Otherwise, you just deposit that to your account balance. Right? Simple. Now, if you implement them like this, and then access this withdraw and deposit through the monitor, you ensure that these are not happening at the same time, then the functionality of, you know, there may be multiple branches or ATMs, whatever. They, might, they may call all these independently, and they don't have to care, 
they don't have to care. Because they are all accessing the same class and the class itself handles that, right? Let's take a look. So, this is again a simple implementation of that. So, in the account, you have a lock. We didn't see this in the last page. And you have a balance, which is again private, so you can't access balance directly. And then you have a public method of withdrawal that can like have a, you know, true or false value. It can be either successful or uh, failure. And then you have a pretty condition here that the amount should be, uh, you know, not negative here. And then you acquire the lock when you enter this. You try to increase or decrease the uh, balance. Whether it happens or not, you have to release the lock and then you exit. It's safe. It's safe programming. You, you don't forget the lock, release the lock, and then whatever happens, it happens here. You return false or true, you're done. And in a deposit case, again, the amount should be non-negative, and then you acquire the lock, you try, and then, you know, balance, incre increment the balance. Whether it happens for any reason or not, you release the lock. You don't forget that. Right? So even exceptions or whatever, you should still make sure that you handle the resources correctly. So in this implementation, you basically hide the details of the synchronization from whoever wants to use this class. You're implementing it in, within itself, you're ensuring no, you know, uh, violation of mutual exclusion, whatever, and it is safe, you implement it once, you don't have to, you know, acquire any lock to access it anymore. Alright? Any question? All right, next we're going to move on to condition variables. So, condition variable, again, is a different use. With only semaphores or monitors, maybe, you don't satisfy the situations with the synchronization. So, for example, a synchronization problem is when a process wants to wait for a condition. Now, what is this condition? It does not necessarily mean a simple integer that you can semi off. Maybe it is only a certain process that one, we want them to finish or at least make progress to a you know, certain point and then we want to continue, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's say you and your roommate want to vacuum you know, the, the room. So whatever, you're, you know, you're vacuuming this part but you want to wait for a condition so they take their stuff from the you know, ground and then you can vacuum underneath there. So you don't want to get blocked and then there's no easy way to like think of it in terms of like lock or semaphore, whatever, right? They have to signal you the condition and then you can, uh, before that you can wait, okay? So the condition variable is uh, a when a thread may need to wait for another a con a condition and we don't want to use busy waiting. We will want to wait for that condition but till that condition we want to block. But remember, in the case of a condition variable, the condition variable itself might also be uh, shared. So, you, you, you actually will see this in the Pintos code, and that is, if, uh, if, uh, if a thread asks the operating system that, okay, block me until this condition is satisfied, and then also provide me with a lock, so I can modify my shared variable. Otherwise, it, you'll have like different situations with condition variable problems. So once the condition is, you know, held, now if this thread comes up and wake, wakes up basically, can they modify the shared variable or not yet? That depends if the, uh, the previous owner has released it yet or not. And then if you want to implement them again in the order, it's just like more difficult. You can do it and it is the implementation of a condition variable, but the condition variable is implemented once so you can use it and that is the condition and the lock uh, have, uh, basically is passed over at the same time. So, the, uh, the first process when they issue the signal to the condition variable, they also release the lock at the same time and the operating system takes them together again to the next who is like waiting for it. So, they are awoken and then, you know, told that the condition is hold and you have the lock to access at the same time. And again, this is, uh, you know, handled by the OS, so the, the threads don't have to communicate anymore. So, condition variables queue threads until a certain condition is met, and it is non-blocking and non-busy waiting. 
they go to, uh, you know, the sleep and then they woke it up. Again, they don't have to, after that, they don't have to block themselves because the condition is met already. And if there are multiple, uh, threads, the two, the two conditions, uh, the weight, but basically when you, uh, when you invoke a weight on a condition, you're put to sleep by the operating system and only woken up when you have, you know, the access. And when you signal, if there is another thread waiting for their con- this condition, then you wake them up. However, if there is no thread waiting for that condition, this signal does not do anything. This is like a, the difference, for example, between the condition variable and the semaphores. Right? So there is no you know, integer here that I increase. It only, it, it happens now. The condition happens now. If someone is waiting for it, I'm going to let them know and, you know, wake them up. If not, that's fine. Right? No one is waiting for this. So let's see, for example, how this can be used. This, we're going to actually solve the philosopher problem with this. So we're going to, like, have three different states for each philosopher. They can be either thinking, they can be hungry, and eating. The hungry mean, me, is meaning that they have indicated that they want to eat, but they don't have the resources yet. Right? And then uh, you have five of these. You have a condition variable here, which is called self, and this is to delay philosopher when he is hungry, but unable to get chopsticks. So if you are hungry, you want to be put to sleep, and only woken up when the condition is met which means you have the two chopsticks, right? And so let's take a look at uh, this code here. So the initialization code is that, okay, all of them start at thinking, right? They don't want uh, any chopstick for now, they start. And uh, when they want to pick up, basically we say, uh, when you call pick up an I, remember this, uh, when you have multiple threads, they have access to each other's variables, and as we saw in the previous example, maybe a thread calls, you know, uh, acquire and another th- thread calls uh, release or something like that. So in this case, it doesn't matter which thread calls it. If this function is called with i, that means uh, state of the i philosopher goes to hungry because they want to pick up the chopsticks. So this is the first indication. Now we test the condition. We, this, we, uh, we basically pass this only if both neighbors are not eating. Then, if we, uh, then they start eating. This, we actually gonna see it in the next slide. If we start eating, that's fine. If we, if we has, we have not been uh, changed to eating, then we should wait for them. Okay, one more time. They go to hungry, and then they test their left and right, uh, and then see if they have the availability to start eating or not. If they have not changed to eating, then that means this test was not passed, and they should just like, you know, wait. So, the test function is like this. If, if, if you want to test this seat, first you check that they are hungry, then you check that the left and the right philosopher is not in eating mode, And if they're not in eating mode, you change this philosopher to eating, and then you signal them. So if they're waiting, you know, wake up and eat. When you want to put down, it's easier. So if if philosopher I want to put down, what happens is that they change to thinking state, and then they test their left and right. This test is now different. Let's see what happens. So, the only thing that they, they want to run is that the, we first need to initialize them, and then the, whatever the, the, each of the threads of the philosophers, they only need to pick up, eat, and put down. And then go back to thinking. Again, come here, pick up, eat, and put down. Let's go over the code and see how it works. So, the pick up for, let's say, only one of them, the first one, or the second one, right, wants to eat. So, they are in the thinking state, they call this. So, the state of them go to hungry, they test I. And then, they test uh, I with number one. So, number one state is hungry, true. 
the state 2 is not eating, that's true. State 0 is also not eating, so that's true. So basically that means they have the ability to start eating. So you only change the eating state for them. You signal self i. Is anyone waiting on condition variable number 1? No. So it doesn't actually matter. Remember, this is the condition variable signal, that's why it's red. So it doesn't do anything. It's fine. So we go back to here. So because their uh, uh, state has now changed to eating, so this doesn't run, they don't have to wait, they have been actually starting eating, and then they keep eating. They actually go into the you know, eating part of code. And once they want to put down, let's see, the, the state goes back to thinking, they call test on the left and right. On the left and right, uh, if the state is hungry, actually they're not hungry, so we don't care, right? We just jump out. So, if one philosopher is running, that's fine. So, what happens if a philosopher is running, uh, or eating basically, and the next philosopher calls to pick up? So, if they call pick up, they become hungry, first thing first, and then they test. In the test, they are hungry, but the left person is eating. So, we cannot go to eating mode, and we definitely run, don't run this. So, let's see what happens. Because the test was not successful, because they have not been changed to eating state, they have to wait. So, this philosopher is eating, the next philosopher calls this, they go to wait. Now, what happens if the first philosopher is done? When they call the put down, they go to thinking, they're done. They call test on the right person and the left person. The left person doesn't matter. Again, they're not hungry. But this person is hungry. So let's see what this does. The test checks if they are hungry. Yes, they are. If their left side is not eating, we just change it from eating to thinking, right? This is not eating anymore. And consider their right is also not eating at this point. And basically that means they were waiting only for us. So we change their state to eating and then we signal them. We are in the, like, the uh, zeroth philosopher, but we call this test with one, right? Because of this. Now, we signal them. What happens this when we signal them? So, because they were waiting here, this signal now wakes them up. And, basically, they continue eating. Because we changed their uh, status to eating, and we forcefully basically gave our chopsticks to them. Eat, go ahead. Right. So, this is, again, you got to like read this a couple of times and remember, thread number three can call this test uh, with two and, or three or one. Either themselves, left or right. Okay? So, we're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So, no two philosophers eat at the same time with this, and uh, there's no deadlock, but we are not guaranteeing the starvation. The starvation is, can still occur. What is the starvation? Starvation is when a process never is removed from a semaphore queue, right? Because if we don't keep the order, one of them may starve. We, the others keep eating, right? There's no deadlock. There is progress overall, but one of them is not a, you know, acquiring it for some reason. So, you can think of how we can change or what we can ensure so that, you know, if they indicate their hungriness like earlier, at some point we give them the chopstick and, you know, don't starve them. Okay? So, the last example is the sleeping barber problem. And let's take a look. So, this is uh, another problem. So, Let's say we have a, like a barbershop. Let's say here is a barbershop. We have like waiting seats, all of you are waiting, and I'm the barber. So I'm going to sit over here and then sleep until a customer comes. When there is a customer, I want them to come and sit at the, you know, here, barber chair, and then I cut their hair. And then they're, you know, go out. And so the situation is, if a new customer comes, if there are no chairs available, they have to leave or come back after some time. And if there is no customer here, I have to, you know, I want to go back to sleep. Now, how do you want to implement this? Again, this problem is very, you know, complex in terms of like all the semaphores. So, make sure that you understand it. If there's any question, we're going to cover it again next session, right? Or you can cover it in the recitations. So, the first thing is, we use three semaphores. 
Uh, one for any waiting customers, one for barber to see if he's idle, and a mutex. So the mutex is to basically access the shared variable, the number of available seats. I can reduce it because I want to call a customer. You can reduce it by, you know, coming and wanting to sit him down, right? Oh, sorry, I want to increment it. I want to, like, make a seat available. And when a customer arrives, he attempts to acquire the mutex first to access the number of seats. And the customer then checks if there is an empty chair to sit down. And if there is none, then you, they just, like, go and leave or come back at a different time, whatever. Otherwise, the customer takes a seat and then reducing the number of available seats. That's the critical section. So far, so good? So, the next is, now the customer signals the barber. So, if the barber is sleeping, then you basically wake them up. And then, the barber, if, if, they're, if they're not free, if they're already busy, then, you know, uh, the customer should wait. So, that signal should wait. Uh, and then... When I'm done, I have to also signal the next customer. I have to signal the next customer. So this is not a one single. There's like two semaphores involved here, right? So let's take a look at the code. We have semaphore customers. We have semaphore barber. We have the lock to access the seats. We have number of free seats. And this lock is to access that. So the barber is easy. I basically wait for a customer. I don't care who. I wait for a customer and go to sleep if there is none. And then, if there is a customer and they wake me up, remember, at this point, someone has already woken me up. So, there is a customer. I access the lock. I, I increase the free seats, meaning I will take them to the barber's uh, seat. And then, I signal the barber. I signal that thread that, hey, you know, or next thread, basically, uh, next waiting customer to, you know, I'm ready. And then I release the lock and then basically start cutting their hair, right? So the customer is now different. They need a cut, yes, and as long as they have not met their, you know, uh, hair cutting, they keep loop looping here and what they do is that they check the seating. When, first they acquire the lock and then check the number of seats. If the number of seats is not available, then they just release the lock and leave and come back again. If the seat is available, they decrement it, meaning they sit down and occupy a seat. Then, they signal the customers that I, have was, that I was waiting on. So, if I was asleep, they signal, let the barber know, hey, a customer is here, wake up if you are sleeping, right? And then, basically wait for me. Maybe I was busy. Maybe I was not waking, uh, maybe I was not sleeping. So, they should now wait for me to be finished with the previous customer. Once I signal them that, hey, it's your turn, then basically their hair gets cut and then they're finished. Okay? So, this overall is the procedure. Again, you can take a look at how this uh, runs one at a time and how this works. Okay? So, till next session, make sure you empty your, uh, uh, submit your empty, at least empty design document. Finalize your groups on AutoGrader, work on your design doc, and continue the implementation. Alright? If there's any question, let me know.